Hello loved ones. I am so happy that once again you have chosen to join us in our Bible study. Let us pray. Most holy and gracious Father, we come once again to study your word, asking you as always that you would open our hearts and our minds to receive you afresh. Father, we thank you and we love you in Jesus name. Amen. So we are still on article number 11, the perseverance of saints. And our author writes, we believe that such only are real believers as endure unto the end, that their persevering attachment to Christ is the grand mark which distinguishes them from superficial professors, that a special providence watches over their welfare, and that they are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. And we have made our way up to the main attraction on this scenic route. It's, it's the why that we turn off the main road. It's uh, what we've been building up to all this time. Our purpose has been to get a clear view of how much the Father loves us. And that love is not based on us loving the Father, but the Father loving us. <clears throat> John 3, 16, the King James Version says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. This is probably the world's most known scripture. In it, Jesus reveals God's great love for the whole world. Now you got to remember he was talking to Nicodemus. The idea that God loves the whole world would have been a strange concept to Nicodemus. The Jews believed that God loved the, the religious which were the true Jews. And they believed that God hated the non-religious, which would have been the Gentiles. Even in this day and time, the fact that God truly loves, it is hard to comprehend. It is hard for, it's just hard to comprehend, just, just a, a totally giving love. To think that God loves all people, no matter what their brand of sin is. That says that God loves the murderer, the theft, the thief, the bitter, the vengeful, the abuser, the hateful, the liar, the despicable, the prodigal, and the one that stayed at home and did, never did anything. And the list can go on and on. Whatever the case, God loves. God loves every person, not just those who love him. He loves even the unlovable. He loves the selfish, the greedy, the spiteful, the vengeful. He even loves Trump and the folk that ride at the Capitol. The basis of God's love is his nature. God is love. Therefore, he loves. That's just what he does. And his every act is demonstrating and showing that love. Romans 5 and 8, the NIV says, But God demonstrated his own love for us in this, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Love has to express itself. It comes natural. It cannot just sit still and do nothing. When my youngest grandson was born, it didn't take long before we realized that this kid had lots of energy. By the time he was in those toddler years, it was clear to it was clear to call him rambunctious was an understatement. This kid had lots and lots of energy. Therefore, he just had to be doing something. 
and 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 it was usually on the scale of their devil, their devil type things that was just not good for my anxiety level. It seems as it, it seemed as though he just couldn't help it. He just it just came natural for him. Love is like that. If it is in you, it has to act and express itself. It has to do something. Love cannot sit on the sideline and do nothing and just wait and say, well, you know, they'll learn. John 3.16 says, for God so loved. The word for is an introductory that connects what is to be said with what has been said. So it's connecting verse 14 and 15 with verse 16. It, it, it is connected with the simple act of looking up in belief to life and salvation. For God so loved. Note also that loved, L-O-V-E-D, is past tense, meaning that it has already been done. Now, keep in mind, and don't forget, that Jesus is talking to Nicodemus. Nicodemus would have gotten that part about God loving Israel so much that he provided a remedy. But for Jesus to make the comparison to himself and say that just as the serpent was lifted up, he too would be lifted up, and that those who believed in him wouldn't perish, but have ever, eternal life. I'm sure that must have been mind-boggling to Nicodemus. Can't you see the confusion on his face? Can't you hear the question in his mind? Now, remember, even though Jesus was a mystery to Nicodemus, Nicodemus was no mystery to Jesus. If, if you know anything about Jesus, you know that he can answer questions that have not been asked. For Nicodemus, that's pretty much how the conversation was going, had been going that whole night. Jesus was asked, answering questions that Nicodemus hadn't even asked. He, he was just thinking it or I, it, it may not have even, the questions may not have even come to the surface yet. But Jesus was answering. So as if to answer the perplexing look and thoughts of Nicodemus and, and the, 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 the why that he had, why the son of man would be lifted up. And, and just what was Jesus talking about? Jesus says in essence, cause God so loved the world. Jesus could have said, God loved the world. That would have been more than we deserve. But remember, God is love. Love is his nature. Without God, love does not exist. God doesn't just love. God so loved. To, to, to so love means that God's love goes to a great extent. God's love goes beyond just the normal love. God is perfect, which means that his love is perfect. Therefore, God not only loves, but he so loves. He loves to perfection. He loves to the utmost. He loves to the ultimate degree. Whatever the ultimate degree is and whatever the perfect act and expression of love is, God is, and he shows it. God's love is complete. It's all consuming. It's not lacking. Love is not the definition of God. God is much more than that. But God is the definition of love. God's love for us is not defined by what we do or what we don't do. In fact, 
it may be hard to believe that there is, but there is nothing we can do, nothing we can say, nothing we can think that will cause God to love us any more or any less than he already does. God is not surprised by us. We don't catch him off guard. Just like he loves completely, he knows us completely. And in spite of knowing us completely, he still loves us anyway. So, so Jesus talking to Nicodemus it is giving him a picture of love. For God so loved the world. That night, Jesus gave Nicodemus a, a condensed theological explanation of sin and salvation. And none of it, starting with rebirth, probably made any sense to Nicodemus. He, he didn't understand that Christ would literally be lifted up on a pole, just as the snake had been, and, and that Christ's death and resurrection would bring, le bring life. Nicodemus had no idea what Jesus was planning, that Jesus was planning to die for him and for us and for the world. For God so loved the world that he gave. For God so loved. That's a fact. It's a fact. The evidence of that love is that he gave. God so loved that he got involved. God so loved that he didn't just get involved in, in some impersonal way. You know how we are when we really don't want to be bothered, but we want to look good. So instead of giving our time, we just give some money. God wouldn't would, could have just... God could have just sent one of the created beings and told them, go down there and take care of those folks. Just go down there and take care of that matter. But not so. For God so loved that he got personally involved. He sent his son. God sending his son speaks enormous of the love God has for us. As a parent, if, if things got shaky and, and, and somebody needed rescuing, no matter how much I wanted to help, I wouldn't send my son to save anybody. I, I, I would go myself before I sent my son. And, and then if sending my son was the only way to save somebody, then they better have their last will and testament ready. Because... Chances are, it's not going to go well for them. I have I've heard and, and personally know of a case where a mother spent some years in prison because she took the rap for a crime that her son committed. Now, I don't know if I'd go that far, but you get my point. God sending his son is huge. It's major. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God, who is love, actively demonstrated his love through Jesus Christ, his only begotten son. And through him, offered salvation to all mankind. The entire gospel comes to a, a focus in this verse. I, I, I would go so far as to say that every word in that verse is significant. It, it shows the intensity of God's love. He, he gave his best. When you pause, and think of the scope of God's love and how all-encompassing it is. You can't help but come to the conclusion 
that this love of God is amazing. Not just because of how enormous the world is. I mean, when you think that God loved the world, that's amazing. But, but, but it goes deeper than that. Think of how bad the world is. And, God, and yet God loves it. Think, of, think about all of the bad that just you know. Then think of all the bad that you don't know, that you probably hear about, or the things that you don't hear about. The universe is huge, and it's full of bad, full of evil, and yet God loves. His love is not vague. It's not a, a sentimental feeling. It's a love that costs. God gave what was the most dear to him. I read a story of a preacher who for six nights had preached on this one text. Then the seventh night came rolled around and he went into the pulpit. Every eye was upon him. And he said, beloved friends, I have been hunting all day for a new text. But I cannot find anything so great as the old one, the one I've been preaching. So we will go back to John 3.16. And he preached the seventh sermon from those same words. God so loved the world. At the end of that sermon, the preacher said, my friends, for a whole week, I've been trying to tell you how much God loves you, but I cannot do it with this poor stammering tongue. If I could borrow Jacob's ladder and climb up into heaven and ask Gabriel, who stands in the presence of the Almighty, to tell me how much God loves the world, how much love the Father has for the world. All Gabriel could say would be God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. This week, I feel like that preacher. I have spent the whole week struggling with this lesson. I'm usually finished on Saturday evening or Sunday morning. But this week, I struggled. I, I, I struggled. I, I was looking for a way to express the love of God. I, I kept coming back to the same verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I, I, I just finally had to succumb to the, to, 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 that, to the fact that that was the best way to say it. And, and when I succumbed to the Holy Spirit, the struggle ended. Y'all, God loves. He loves them. He loves us. He loves you. He loves me. It's a corporate th type of love, but yet it's so personal. It's refreshing and it's also satisfying. God loves. There's no better way to say it. God loves. Well, loved ones, that is all for today. Join us again next week or next time, uh, 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 as we continue to look at how much the Father loves us. Until then, take care, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining us.